Hello everyone, we're at a lower angle right now because I just wanted to sit down and talk pretty much about some things that I've been enjoying recently and that's it, just talk about some things that I've been enjoying recently. <laughs> There's also going to be at least one thing that's actually a little older um, in terms of a favorite or new favorite. So I don't really know where to start. I have some things in front of me here. I guess I'll start with something I meant to talk about like months ago and that is the film adaptation of Anna Karenina from I why do I always confuse this one I think it's 2012 I used to think it was 2014 but it's 2012 I'm pretty sure now I don't know where the year is on this uh, I have it with this awesome slip cover because films film releases are always better with slip covers am I right yes yeah, so like back in February I think maybe March. I basically this whole year I've been more interested in reading the classics that I have or classics that I don't have um, and that that's where my reading interests lie lately and pretty much for this entire year and I discovered a couple of booktubers who mainly talk about classics and specifically Carolyn at Carolyn Marie Reads, that's her channel name, she was reading Anna Karenina for the first time. And she just made me really want to reread this book. I have already read it. It was at one point the longest book I had ever read. Um, and it's one of my favorite books. But it's like rounding up 800 pages. And I just didn't have time to start an 800 page book. Especially one that I had like already read. Because sometimes I'm like, but I've already read it. I should read a book that I haven't already experienced. So, instead of rereading this humongous book like I wanted to, I opted for re-watching this adaptation of Anna Karenina, which is only one adaptation of which I have every major adaptation release of. There's like the one from the 40s with Vivian Lee. There's two adaptations from the 20s, I think, with Greta Garbo. There's one from the 90s, and there's this one. And I think those are all the major adaptations of Anna Karenina. And I just opted for this one because it wasn't my favorite, but I love the way it's shot, and I just love Kira Knightley. <laughs> Maybe that's it. And it's, it's a beautiful film, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I wanted to the first time that I saw it. But that's completely changed. That has changed. Okay? This adaptation is amazing. It's... it's so good. <laughs> there are two things that made this less enjoyable the first time watching it, and that was, one, I didn't know the way that the film was set up. I didn't know that it's kind of put on like a play. They built a stage to film in, and like, even immediately you can notice this in the film because um, there will be scenes where set pieces are like coming up and down and they're changing, like a character will just be walking and it'll be like a change of scene and they're in a different location and you're seeing the location change on the stage. So that was really, that took me like out of it the first time I watched it. I was kind of confused as to what was happening because it was difficult to distinguish each place as an actually different setting because it was all happening pretty much in this theater that they built. They built a theater in a stage, like a, a sound stage, that's what I mean. But this time around, it was really interesting to see this space redone and how they took advantage of it in a way and were to show us the different uses of the space and and it kind of also works for the story of Anna Karenina because of how significant the society is and the other people in the city that are talking about Anna and that are gossiping and essentially watching her life go to pieces but then additionally there are scenes where they're at the theater or at a horse race and then the sort of audience of the theater is also used in that way hopefully that made sense uh but the other thing that i didn't like so much or that 
I think hindered my first viewing experience of this is that Kitty and Levin are my favorite characters and they're really cut out of this film. This is mostly about Anna, which the book is not so much. I mean, yes, she is the main character. Yes, she's the title character. Yes, her life is a big part of the book. But there is another cast of characters that I think people who aren't familiar with the full story or who haven't read the book wouldn't necessarily know about because the book is just named after her. And I was more invested in Kitty and Levin's storylines when I was reading the book, therefore I was looking forward to the way that their story would be depicted and, again, they're cut out a lot from this film. But upon this rewatch back in, you know, what, February or March now, it made me give more focus to Anna and really look at her differently as a character. And I think it's a great performance by Kira Knightley. And she just made me kind of think about Anna in a different way. I hadn't really... Again, I kind of just brushed her to the side because I was more interested in the other characters. And I, f I feel bad almost for doing that because there's so much that she goes through. And I don't want to go, I should have said this in the beginning, I'm trying not to go into like spoilery detail for anything that I'm talking about, um, except for like one thing maybe. It just really made me appreciate Anna as a character more and coincidentally enough made me just want to reread the book again. Like I watched the movie in the first place because I didn't have time to read the book, but now I just really want to reread it. I'm curious though, um, I have... This is translated by Constance Garnett, who I've heard is actually, like, not the best translator, and I think there's, like, a more recent translation that's come out that is supposedly most the most accurate to Tolstoy's original words. I have to look that up again because it's something that I started to research, so I was another reason why I'm, I haven't, like, started rereading it is because I... I'm possibly interested in reading a different translation just to see, just to see, basically. <laughs> no real reason, just because I can, maybe. So that's Anna Karenina, and if you don't know what this book, the story, is about, I will summarize it very briefly. Uh, it's pretty much Anna's love affair with Count Vronsky. She's an unhappily married woman uh, with a child. And she has an affair with Count Vronsky. The other characters include Anna's brother, Stepan, and his wife, Dolly. And Dolly is sisters with Kitty. And there's also Levin, who is a friend of Stepan. I think those are all the major characters. There are other minor ones in there. Um, but it's about all of them <laughs> in Russian society. In Moscow society in the late 1800s. I just read part of the introduction and it says the 1860s, so that's when this book takes place. And then we have a sort of combination of things that all culminate under Shirley Jackson. Oh my god, there's a lot that I can talk about here, actually. It all kind of started, <laughs> again, back in like February or March, when I watched the film adaptation of We Have Always Lived in the Castle from 2018. And that is a book by Shirley Jackson that I read back in 2017. Upon watching the film for the first time, I interpreted something that I didn't remember. <laughs> that sentence is really choppy, sorry. I picked up on something that I didn't remember happening in the book. And so it made me want to reread the book because I wanted to know if it was something that was there all along that I didn't pick up on if it was something that I just didn't remember, or if it was something that the filmmakers decided to do um, or sort of imply in the film. So, I reread We Have Always Lived in the Castle, and it really, this, this isn't really about the book. I reread the book, and it wasn't there what I picked up on. But then after I reread the book, I rewatched the movie. <laughs> And I picked up on it again. I didn't know if it was something that I was, like, going too far with the first time that I watched the movie or or if it was something that was maybe more implicitly done, which I do think it is. So, We Have Always Lived in the Castle is about the Blackwood sisters, Mary Cat and Constance, and they live with their Uncle Julian in this house that's pretty much a mansion. And 
they are the remaining Blackwood family members, as the rest of the family was poisoned by Constance, murdered by ingesting arsenic. The townspeople hate them, and their cousin Charles comes to visit, and he's clearly after their money, but he's he's pretending that he's being friendly and wants to help them, but he doesn't. He, he clearly wants their money. <laughs> it's a very short book. My copy is just 146 pages, so there's there's less to spoil in terms of plot, and really it's about the experience of reading the book and Shirley Jackson's writing and the characters. So re-watching the film, um, I am going to tell you about what it is that I picked up on, what how I interpreted the film adaptation, which upon rewatching, again, it was just like, oh my god, I really like this movie. This is also going in my like accurate adaptations list because I just love adaptations. Most of them, they're kind of iffy sometimes. I get really nervous with them because I'm someone who likes to, like, I just want to see the book on screen. That's it. Like, I don't want a lot of liberties to be taken in terms of like what people decide to like change or alter or which is literally just a synonym of change. Yeah, I don't like a lot of changes, but I do think that they can be done well and be seen more as a different take. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I think it kind of just depends on maybe what the story is. Like I, as I said before with We Have Always Lived in the Castle, it's it's more about the characters and reading the story that Shirley Jackson wrote. And so it's something that can be easily reworked in different ways through different mediums. And people can kind of have their own interpretation of it, especially because there is a lot of like ambiguous, vague information and you're left wondering like what, what, what you're just, kind of left wondering a lot of different things. To me, I'm most curious about what the family members who died, what they were really like, especially because there's kind of this mix of of Mary Cat being an unreliable narrator and because Uncle Julian did ingest uh, the arsenic, his brain has effects from the arsenic poisoning and you can't tell if if what he's saying is something that was true or he can't can't remember correctly or if he's saying something that he thinks is true. Anyway, what I picked up on is that there's a scene when I'm still going to try to not to give like too much context of like what like other things that are happening, but there's a scene when cousin Charles is really angry and yelling at Maricat and he's pretty much dragging her upstairs and trying to like punish her and Constance, Constance, Alexandra Daddario as Constance in this is really good, I think. Um, she's not how I imagined Constance when I first read the book, but it doesn't matter because I think she does the character very well. She's constantly putting on this like fake smile and like here you see it break because there's a moment when, when Charles is like on top of Mary Cat on the stairs, telling her to stop talking because she keeps on talking on about different poisons and the effects that they have. And he wants her to shut up. And so he kind of pins her down and holds, I think he holds his, his hands over his mouth. Uh, in any case, he's like on top of her on the stairs. And there's a moment when Constance is like really taken aback by this. You can tell she's just trying to get through things and not make a big deal out of things so that so that she can just have this life, like so that everything's fine, like keep pretending kind of. But it's also mentioned a lot that Cousin Charles looks like their father and that their father was a terrible man and manipulative and clearly you can tell there was some kind of family abuse going on, but with this scene in particular, I was like, I wonder if Constance was, like, sexually abused by her father. I should probably put, like, sh should I say a trigger warning for that earlier in the video? Because it's just, like, again, the whole movie, the whole time, she's really trying to put on this smile and pretend that things are okay and that they can get better and they're fine just living their life the way it is. But then the scene happens and she freezes. 
and her smile goes away and it's kind of a change because she's not defending Charles anymore or or going along with things that he says she's again on Mary Cat's side this is kind of an intense scene in other ways um, with other things that are going on but then later towards the end Charles returns and he breaks his way into the kitchen and now this is a different this is a difference between the book and the film they added this in and I think it works and also that that scene on the stairs is also something that they added they just kind of go up the stairs it's not this huge fight where Charles is being violent against either one of them um, because ultimately he's just selfish and is more worried about his own self-preservation than anything else. So later towards the end of the story he returns to the house in the book they don't answer and he just leaves but in the movie he breaks his way into the house and into the kitchen where the girls are and he flings himself towards Constance and she like falls onto the ground and he's like pleading with her to like forgive forgive what he did and how he left and and other things that would be more spoilery for what happened but she is terrified and yelling at him to get off of her and to not touch her and he's trying to but also like he thinks that comforting her physically will help uh clearly not because she is yelling so much and really just terrified you can see it on her face and that kind of confirmed it for me uh, me thinking that she was at least in some sort of physical way abused by her father but with Charles being on top of the girls in the situations that just kind of made me think made me lean more towards sexually abused and then there's also something the movie adds where before their father died, before the poisoning, Constance had a boyfriend and they were like gonna run away. Their father intervened and made the boy's life worse in different ways. Uh, I kind of can't remember the specifics, but also those aren't necessarily details that I need to go into. So you can tell that their father was really possessive over Constance. And Constance is also this character that has sort of been groomed to be this typical 1950s housewife and that's it she's the cook she clean like that's her life she cooks and cleans all day this huge house and took care of took care of things pretty much and continues to even after the other family members were poisoned and died so I'm curious if anyone else has seen that adaptation I think it's it's the only adaptation of We Have Always Lived in the Castle that I'm aware of. Although there are those more inaccurate parts in terms of it being a faithful adaptation, I think it's a great film and a great adaptation nonetheless, even with those additional points. But with rereading We Have Always Lived in the Castle, I also read The Haunting of Hill House, also by Shirley Jackson, and this was not a reread, so... I was experiencing this for the first time and it's so good. I think I like it more than We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Again, there's like a lot of subtext to it and more ambiguous characters and plot points to it. And I enjoyed it so much that I have subsequently bought two more Shirley Jackson books uh, that I bought with some birthday money that I got. So I also have The Bird's Nest by Shirley Jackson, uh, which I think has to do with a woman, a young woman who goes to a mental institution, at least has some sort of like mental breakdown. I was like kind of thinking at the same time that I was reading, so I'm just gonna read like the last sentence on the back here. It says, the bird's nest is a macabre journey into who we are and how close we sometimes come to the brink of madness. Wait, what the heck? As a tormented Elizabeth becomes two people, then three, then four, each wilder and more wicked than the last, a battle of wills threatens to destroy the girl and all who surround her. I'm gonna read this soon, hopefully. I plan in this upcoming like couple of weeks to get a lot of reading done, hopefully, because I've been in the mood and um, I've had to set reading aside and also watching movies aside because I've been focusing on a project. So, a project for school, by the way. Uh, not something that would like be going on YouTube. Although I was working hard on those uh, Criterion Channel Year One videos. Anyway, the other Shirley Jackson book that I got is The Lottery and Other Stories. All I know is this is a short story collection. 
including The Lottery, which is her first published work, at least. It's also one of the inspirations, or at least loose inspirations. Again, I'm not very familiar with The Lottery, but I recently watched Midsommar, which one of my friends was saying that it's based on The Lottery, or at least she thought it was based on The Lottery, so which she has read, so I'm gonna trust her on that. And this is relatively short too, and goes through, has a lot of different stories in it, so it's not like there's necessarily one synopsis for this. But just bringing it back to The Haunting of Hill House, I just wanted to mention those other books because Shirley Jackson, her writing is so good, and that's why I bought those other books, as well as I was just really interested in reading The Bird's Nest anyway, because it has to do with mental illness in some way, which is like mental illness, psychology, that's an area and a topic in books that I am really interested in, or a topic in stories. Basically, if I'm reading like the back of a book or a synopsis for a film or anything, really, I, it just, it's like one of those buzzwords for me that just uh, makes me all the more interested in consuming whatever piece of art or media that it is. So with reading The Haunting of Hill House, I rewatched the film adaptations, both of which I had already seen in previous years, and then I watched the Netflix series for the first time, which I've been putting off because I, even though the trailer like confused me because, wow, okay, I'm kind of all over the place here. So let's see, the 1963, I think, is... The first film adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House, which is just shortened to The Haunting. That's the first film adaptation, and that one's really good. That one's the best, in my opinion. It's the best in terms of an adaptation and the best in terms of just a film. If you don't know what The Haunting of Hill House is about, it has to do with Eleanor, who she's... It's not written in first person, but you do mostly see things from her perspective. She is invited to Hill House, where this doctor is uh, doing experiments and, and doing a study uh, on the supernatural, on the haunting. So her and Theodora, who just goes by Theo, are invited to stay at the house by Dr. Montague. And then there is Luke, who is also invited because he is part of the family that owns Hill House and eventually he will inherit Hill House. Those are the four main characters, and later uh, Dr. Montague's wife ends up coming along with another guy whose name I'm not remembering right now. So really it's just these six characters, um, and mostly just the four throughout most of the book and story. And I just like the setup of the house a lot in the 1963 film adaptation. It seems like an older house. It seems like there's a history to it that is intriguing and that you want to know as as a viewer, as an audience member. I don't know, just the way that the haunting things are done in this as well is more effective in my opinion. And I also like the fact that it's in black and white. I just think it works better. And even with some things that they kind of add and elaborate with the characters. I don't really mind that so much. Uh, you can tell that Eleanor, they really make Eleanor seem like she is in love with Dr. Montague. So that's just because Dr. Montague is like giving her more attention and she throughout most of her life took care of her mother. So to be paid attention to in more than just a, a needing way, in more than just a way of being used almost, and actually take a personal interest in her, kind of gives her this sort of attachment to Dr. Montague. However, however, oh my god, I can't believe I didn't say any of this before. There is such, there is such lesbian subtext in the book. I personally, I feel like Eleanor is more of like a lesbian and Theodora is by that's what I was getting. A lot of people think that what I was reading online, most people think that Theo is a lesbian and then like I don't even really hear people talking about Eleanor, but there's such a theme that's kind of weaved into the story of this repression um, that I interpreted as sexual repression. Maybe, what is up with me? What is up with me? And just automatically going the sexual route you know, with Constance, 
it was like, obviously there's some sort of abuse in the family, but I think it's sexual abuse. And then here I am again saying there is some sort of repression in the subtext and a theme within the within the story. It must be sexual repression. But I think it's true. Uh, repression overall, especially because of Eleanor like taking care of her mother and really not having that much experience anywhere, um, like in any area of life, but then also like sexually. Um, and then obviously like things that have to do with the haunting kind of also being like, what did I, what did I write in my book? I ended up writing a lot. Um, I like to annotate my books. So here's just like a random page that I flipped to. I don't even know how well you can see it, but here I just have like brackets around areas um, and underlined underlined passages and then like here it says something. Um, I usually mark things that I think are important either to the story, uh, to the characters, whether it's obvious or something that I think may come up again and may be important um, with other information that we learn. Or I may just really like the way something is written and that will, I'll underline that or mark that passage somehow. Yeah, look it. The writing on this page literally takes up the top margin and the side margin. I was going to try to find the page where I was like talking about this though. Because it could be seen that there's like a connection between the haunting and repression, <laughs> basically. I mean, I could just sum it up like that, couldn't I? Oh, I wrote this. This is on page 38 in this Penguin Modern Classics edition. From information revealed earlier and specific words used, I'm getting the impression that Eleanor is a lesbian and the house and or story has to do with or represents this repressed, what is it? That, that repressed sexuality. Although maybe sexuality in general, as opposed to lesbianism specifically. And now I'm saying maybe just repression <laughs> and not sexual repression specifically. But I mean, you can narrow it down and it still kind of works. Anyway, um, where was I? <laughs> with the 1963 adaptation, they make Eleanor kind of like fall in love with Dr. Montague, with Dr. Montague, um, or at least think that she's in love with him. I kind of interpret it in that way more than her actually loving him. And then she finds out that he's married and she's heartbroken. As well as in the film, it, to me, it seems like Theo is really flirtatious with Luke. It almost seems like they're kind of pairing, they're making two pairings of the four characters. It could have been worse, definitely, in terms of establishing those pairings. I'm glad that Theo and Eleanor still got a lot of time together um, because they're easily the two main characters and they have rooms that connect and then later on they end up sharing a room, so they spend a lot of time together too. I do realize I still am kind of all over the place in terms of talking about The Haunting of Hill House and its adaptation, so hopefully this isn't too unorganized. And then the 1999 adaptation? I have heard crazy terrible things about this. By the way, I had already seen the 63 adaptation a handful of years ago, maybe like three, three or four years ago, and then the 90s adaptation I saw growing up as a kid. At some point, my brother and I, my younger brother and I watched it because horror and scary movies, that, that's his favorite genre, or at least was growing up, so we watched a lot of them. Which brings me to, I don't think this movie is that terrible. Like, it's not great by any means, but I think I really remembered it being cheesy and it's also just the kind of horror movie that I grew up with. Grew up with not only because I watched a lot of horror movies and scary movies, but also I was born in the 90s and and late 90s movies and early 2000s movies, like those are really going to be more a part of my childhood than, you know, other things that I was just watching that were already previously released. So yeah, I didn't think it was that terrible. Like I remember the cheesy CGI effects and the haunting aspects aren't as well done in this film as they are 
in the 63 version in my opinion because it just like doesn't age very well. And this also just had this weird, oh dang it, I can't, I can't look at my letterbox review because I'm using my phone to film. It seemed like it didn't really know its purpose. It changes up the storyline a little bit in terms of why they're there, the purpose of, the point of the experiment, the study. It's Dr. Montague tricks them into thinking that it's a study on insomnia. But he's really studying the idea of a haunting and seeing how planting clues and planting ideas in their minds may evolve into thinking that the mansion that they're staying in, Hill House, is haunted. So a good portion of the film is this sort of setup and learning about the history of the house, you know, setting up why it could be haunted. But then it really takes a turn when Eleanor starts to find more out, but you don't even like follow her really at that point. Suddenly there's just like, it feels like there was footage that was cut or something because suddenly she knows all these things and it's like, where were we when she was figuring this out? That's something that we should have been involved in. So she just knows all this stuff suddenly, and then the real haunting begins. Like, there wasn't even that much done before to show a haunting. So then that's when the movie really becomes the sort of, like, haunting scary movie, because that's more so how this is marketed as. That's why I was grouping it in with the scary movies from, like, the late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, and then just, like, connections and stuff. It was just really weird. But I do really like that this house is really nice. <laughs> Except for all, like, the babies everywhere. That was really, like, yeah, the changes that they made to, like, the sort of origin story were kind of, they were icky. I didn't like them. Uh, and the children everywhere. It was weird. But it still wasn't as bad of a movie as I thought it was going to be, the way that people just like really tear into it and just, it's, it's fine. <laughs> will I ever watch it again? Probably not. <laughs> I will say it is something that I could put on and get sucked into in some ways, <laughs> if that makes sense. Oh, also they stuck with some of the subtext it, from the story and Theo was definitely buying this. So that brings me to the Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. The I'm going to I'm going to call it a mini series because it is going to be an anthology series. The second season is going to be called or is called technically it's done. It's coming out later this year, I'm pretty sure. It's called The Haunting of Bly Manor, and that is a loose adaptation of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And loose is very much intentional um, on my part, like s stating that it's a loose adaptation and that's just how the creators also go by uh, talking about the series. It's Mike Flanagan who is the director and writer of the series um, and you can tell that he's he takes the text, the original text, and does his own thing with it and explores different areas and themes that the original text lends itself to. With The Haunting of Hill House, he changes it up a lot. Um, I'd say just the basic plotline is the same. There is a family in Hill House being haunted, <laughs> and uh, it has a lot of the same like character names, there's a character named Eleanor, there's a character named Luke, there's, there's a character named Theo, um, even Dr. Montague is in it, but he's like Eleanor's therapist, who is played by Russ Tamblin, who I know, of course, as Dr. Jacoby from Twin Peaks, but he also plays Luke in the original 1963 The Haunting. So that's cool. It was also really weird seeing him in glasses, and then they were like normal glasses and not the blue and red ones. <laughs> I honestly thought that when I was watching the show. I was like, this looks wrong for some reason. And then I realized it was because he was wearing regular glasses. <laughs> but he's like very briefly in it, so Dr. Montagu is barely a character. But this story focuses on the Crane family, who in the novel are the, the creators, the builders of the original family <laughs> of Hill House. But the Crane family in this miniseries is just temporarily at Hill House. 
they are flippers and going to renovate the house so that another family can buy it and they can then have the money to build their dream house, their forever home. But their stay there is elongated as many problems arise and they end up staying for multiple months and during this time their children mostly are uh, being tormented by ghosts and haunting events. And these also continue into their lives after they move out of Hill House. And there's specifically the one night that they do leave Hill House is... Well, I can't go into that because that'd be spoilers. <laughs> what am I saying? But there's like a significant night when their father rounds them up. There's five children. Oh, let's see if I can remember. Stephen is the oldest. Then there's Shirley, which I'm assuming her she's named after Shirley Jackson. Um, Theo, Theodora, but Theo for short, and then the twins, Eleanor and Luke. Well, Eleanor's the youngest, so I should have said her last. That's uh, the five kids in order of oldest to youngest, Eleanor being the younger twin. And their father rounds them up one night and leaves the house, and he takes them to a motel, goes back to the house, and it turns out that their mother died that night. So, um, again, I'm, I'm trying not to go into, like, very specific details there. You could tell that from the trailer, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and I remember watching the trailer for this show, being excited because it, like, looked good, but also being very confused because I had previously seen the Haunting adaptation from 1963 and remembered that pretty well. And that's not at all what I remembered, like, just watching the trailer for this miniseries, or for this series, I was like, that's not The Haunting of Hill House. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but it's not an adaptation, and it's not. It's a series that loosely takes its basis from Shirley Jackson's original work, but again, Mike Flanagan does its own thing with it. I worded it much better previously. But these characters are still dealing with so-called hauntings in their life, uh, in their lives that has continued since their childhood, and specifically Nell, um, Eleanor, and Nell is her nickname. I have not called her Nell this whole time. I've only called her Eleanor, but um, she mostly goes by Nell in this in this adaptation. They rarely call her Eleanor. Nell and Luke are the two children that were most greatly affected by what happened living at Hill House. And I kind of lost track of where I was meant to... I had a path and I forgot where I was going. But overall, this series I have mixed feelings on because it was good. I didn't think it was great, but I did think it was like well done. To an extent, there were a lot of things that I liked about the production of it that I did really like, but then there were a lot of things that I also didn't like. <laughs> so again, I just have mixed feelings on it. I liked in the beginning how it seemed like there was an episode for each character. First it was Steve, then she, I think it just goes in like, again, from oldest to youngest. And those episodes seem like they focus more on those characters during their respective episode. And the first one, you know, you always expect the first episode to be at least intriguing, but like maybe the pacing's a little off, maybe it's a little slow. You're getting into things, but it, there should be enough there to get you interested in continuing, and it definitely does that. And then the second episode, I liked it. It was interesting. The third episode, Theo's episode, was probably my favorite. Yeah. I'm just going to say that right now. They make her character, like, a full-on lesbian. <laughs> um... And she continues to have, like, the same traits as Theo, which I didn't even mention before, but she's kind of, um, she has this, like, psychic ability where she kind of, like, feels things when she touches them. There's some sort of, like, psychic connection to things when she touches them, and she wears gloves often. And Theo was, like, just by far my favorite character. Yeah, and then it continues with Luke's character with an episode about more so focusing on Luke, and then another episode more so focusing on Nell, and then the rest kind of are all jumbled. Like, it does seem like the sixth episode has more to do with, I think, the their father, and then the seventh episode more to do with their mother, or maybe I'm mixing those two up. So I like the idea of kind of focusing and having a specific perspective for a majority of the episodes, but there were some things that I noticed that as the show kept going, 
I continued to pick up on and I wouldn't say ruined the experience, but I really didn't like those things. So I guess I'll just be more specific and tell you them. <laughs> Particularly, the pacing was all over the place and there were also just a lot of things that I felt like were already implied and like I wasn't surprised by. So one of those things that I noticed and then kept noticing, then it just continued to bother me as it kept happening within the show, and it also contributes to issues that I had with pacing, is that there were many times when characters were telling a story and it would just show them telling the story as if you're, you know, look it, you're watching me, maybe you're watching me, maybe you're just listening. Maybe you've already exited the video. But there were times where characters were telling a story and it would just be a shot on their face for like eight minutes. I don't know. It was excruciatingly long. Maybe it was only three minutes or four minutes. It had, it had to have been at least five minutes every time though, I swear. And it would start off like pretty far back and then just really, really slowly be zooming in while they're telling a story. And obviously I, I'm coming closer to the camera much faster than it was actually zooming in. But it was just scenes that lasted for multiple minutes like this. And I'm like, why are we not seeing... Okay, I'm going to stop. But I was like, why are we not seeing what they're, what they're saying? Like, it was just one of those easy examples of show don't tell. Because... I feel like those stories didn't even really add to the plot and they would have been more interesting to see instead of listening to the character tell the story. And then the other thing that I, you know, started to get into is just that there were things that were implied, I feel like at least, maybe, maybe this is a me issue because it's easy for me to pick up on things most of the time, usually. It's easy for me to figure things out. If something is happening, if there was some sort of a twist, and I just feel like the show had absolutely no payoff, like, there wasn't- I thought there was gonna be, like, a main mystery to it, and I just- I don't see that, really. It kind of is about, like, oh, what happened that night when their father, like, rounds them all up, and that's the last night that they stay at Hill House, and their mom died. So, like, what, what specifically happened that night? Like, that's kind of a mystery. And then there's also this mystery of, like, what's going to happen in the present because it goes back and forth in time a lot. I totally forgot to mention that, but it goes back and forth in time. So it's kind of also with the characters in the present dealing with things that are happening then, but also all this stuff from the past is coming up again. And so it's kind of like, how are these two things, how is the past going to collide with the present and what does that mean for the characters? What are they going to do about it? What is going to happen in the present? It's just these two things of what happened and what is going to happen. And it, it played out. That's, like, I saw and I was just like, okay. Like, literally, I did not find anything surprising about the show. Nothing. <laughs> like, I, I'm trying to think if there was really something that I was surprised by, but I don't think I was. Like, it gave us hints to things, it it gave us clues, and ultimately I just thought that it was going to be a much more compelling show and have more depth to it, and I do think it has a lot of depth in terms of the characters and what they're- it's very character-driven, which I very much like, but I still feel like I wanted a little more. Maybe that partially- I think it partially has to do with because I was already familiar with the story somewhat, so especially with, like, Theo- or just the way that the characters were set up, it was easy to understand them pretty early on. Which means later when you find things out, it's not, again, it's not surprising because you're like, yeah, that's kind of what their personality is like. I could see that that would be their reaction or that that's what they would do in this situation. I hope it doesn't come off as me like really hating the show or anything. I just, again, I had higher expectations for it. There's um one booktuber that I watch or like she kind of, she talks about books and films and, and uh, shows, so she kind of is trying not to be too much into, like, the booktube corner, but her- I think this is her favorite show, or it's at least one of her favorite shows, and so the way that she was talking about it sometimes made me, you know, get my hopes up more, and I, I'm just like, she thinks it's very compelling, and I just don't. <laughs> but I mean, people are can have different opinions on things, 
that's obviously it's fine. It's just it's interesting that she uses the word compelling for the show and I was like, this is not compelling. That's also, you know, that's not supposed to be a diss on her either. Just clarifying there. Even though, again, I didn't love it, but there are things that I loved about it. I am still very interested and really looking forward to The Haunting of Bly Manor. Um, I feel like maybe this, a reason I could be more excited for this is just because I think it has a lot more potential. I think there's a lot more area that can be, many different areas that can be explored that the turn of the screw sets up. With The Haunting of Hill House, a lot of what they did in the series it's made up, it's fabricated, but very different from the book. Whereas I feel like The Turn of the Screw already is such like a basic story in a way that it allows for a lot to be explored. Are you understanding the difference I'm making? <laughs> Maybe if you've read, <laughs> I mean, I've read The Turn of the Screw and hated it, by the way. <laughs> um, one of my least favorite books that I've ever read. And meanwhile, I really enjoyed the Haunting of Hill House, so maybe it's also just the difference of experience I had with reading the original source material, but I don't know. Is that is that differentiation coming across where, like, there's kind of more specificities included in The Haunting of Hill House, and while each story still has some ambiguity to them, I just found the turn of the screw to have less developed areas and vague areas that, again, can be further explored in some sort of reiteration of the story. And I also like that Mike Flanagan is working with a lot of the same cast members as well. I think that's cool when, I don't know, I've, I like when, when projects, I like when directors or, I don't know, someone in filmmaking kind of has their own world and they're constantly pulling from, from people. <laughs> I like it when it seems like there's really a team behind certain things. You know, Wes Anderson films, he's constantly using the same cast members and crew members, so it seems like, you know, there's that familiarity there, and I think it can improve improve films a lot when the cast members are already, when everyone already has, like, an established relationship. That's what, you know, like, Ryan Murphy does with his, his shows, and um, now here's Mike Flanagan. I mean, these are just a few examples. Yeah, The Haunting of Hill House miniseries on Netflix. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say. I do have a review of it on Letterboxd that I go through most of what I talked about here. I'll link that in the description if you're interested. Yeah, um, I'll, and the cast members, that's what I was starting to say, the cast members. I really liked, um, yeah, the people involved in this. And the kids were so good. Oh my goodness gracious. The kid who plays little Luke. <laughs> adorable. Cutest kid on the face of the earth. The earth, that's it, okay? He's adorable. Yes. So that brings me to one more thing. <laughs> I've been filming for one hour and 20 minutes, but I've been stumbling a lot, so I do think I'm going to be able to cut this down quite a bit. But I have one more book and adaptation to talk about, and that is Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. And this is something that I kind of have the opposite feelings on, whereas with The Haunting of Hill House, I very much enjoyed this book. I wouldn't call it one of my favorite books, but it's it's just so well written, and writing for me is like a huge factor into like how much I enjoy a book and how much I like a book ultimately. It'll be something that I look at fondly because of how well it was written. Although I do like the 63 adaptation a lot, the series adaptation is what I have the most thoughts on, and I just felt, you know, lukewarm about it. It was okay. There were, again, mixed feelings. There were a lot of things that I liked, and there were a lot of things that I didn't like. And this is a book where there were things that I liked and there were things that I didn't like, but I watched the 1981 miniseries, and it's so good. It's incredible, but we're going to talk about the book first. So Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh is about Charles Ryder. Oh, there's like a, a subtitle to this that is, I think is important. It should be on the cover, but it's not. Brideshead Revisited, The Sacred and Profane Memories of Captain Charles Ryder. So it starts off during World War II and... Uh, Charles is now a captain in the army. So him and another group of 
sold soldiers, I guess, are camped out or like have their new headquarters at an area called Brideshead. It's kind of, they don't really know where they are at first, but then Charles recognizes the place as Brideshead, which he is very familiar with because of a friend during some formative years of his life who lived at Brideshead. And so it starts from Charles's perspective during World War II. The entirety of the book, except for the prologue and the epilogue, take place in the past. And this is, these are the memories that Charles is remembering while he is at Brideshead with the soldiers with the military, the battalion, the, I like, I don't know what words to use. So it starts off when Charles is a freshman in college, um, at university, and he meets Sebastian Flight, and they become pretty much best friends, but possibly more than that. Going into this, I thought that this was about them being lovers, but, <laughs> but it was very, like, not there. It was just very much not there, and I don't know if it's, something I don't know it just wasn't as explicit as I thought it was going to be not that I was like expecting explicit sex scenes or anything like that but I was at least expecting legitimate love scenes in the way of them being really tender towards each other or something like that and that didn't happen so I questioned their relationship I was like am I am do I want them to be together because it's what I thought going into it are they together and it's just very much implied and there for readers to pick up on or is it like I just I don't know I don't think it really matters you can take it whatever way you want personally I le like they just belong together in any context like it, it doesn't have to be like a sexual relationship they don't have to be like lovers or boyfriend and boyfriend but they needed each other in their lives. They they belong together in some way, even if it's just a friendship. That's what I think. At least the friendship, at least the friendship, but like something more, I don't know. I feel like they belong together, okay? But I'm just saying you could take that as friendship if you want. So the book is split up into three like books. Um, essentially three parts besides the prologue and the epilogue. And the first part is Charles and Sebastian at school and mostly their time together. And that's my favorite part of the book, to be honest. I just was really much more interested in, you know, the shenanigans that they got into and their time together than anything else in the book. The middle part is when Sebastian's family starts to come more into play in terms of kind of invading their friendship, which is something that Sebastian was trying to avoid with Charles. Um, he wanted him all to himself because he knew the way that his mother, at least, would react and, and try to have more control over Sebastian's life. It's about Lady Marchman really trying to become kind of close to Charles so that he can sort of spy on Sebastian for her or so that he can tell her things about Sebastian and so that she can, again, like, have more control. He wants, she wants him to really focus on studying and not make a mockery out of the family and Catholicism. Religion has a lot to do with this. I'm personally not religious and don't know, I just know, like, basics of different religions. That's why I think the subtitle of the book is really important the sacred and profane memories of Captain Charles Ryder because they pretty often talk about religion and Lady Marchman is a devout Catholic and really and really forces her beliefs and systems onto other people, especially the members of her family. This second part of the book is also when Sebastian starts to kind of fade from the story and Julia comes into into the story more. Uh, Julia is Sebastian's sister. I'm pretty sure a younger sister by only like a few years or so. And then the third part is mostly about Charles and Julia's relationship. So it's very character driven and uh, something I noticed while watching the miniseries is that it's a lot of conversation. You're kind of just watching people, you know, converse in different rooms and in different areas. 
um, which I don't I don't really mind. But once I caught on to it in the miniseries, thankfully I was most of the way through. But I realized how uneventful it is to watch or to consume. But when you think about all that happens, it seems like a lot happens. It seems more eventful. Um, I'm going to put it down now <laughs> um, and just generally talk about it. So yeah, I was much more interested in Charles and Sebastian's relationship. And to be honest, I really just didn't believe Charles and Julia's relationship. They get together and obviously like it's sexual and romantic but I just like I just didn't believe it I was like you don't really like her Charles <laughs> and especially because there's like a significant line that Julia says and that Charles confirms and it's that Sebastian was the former to me indicating that Charles is more in love with Sebastian whether you want to interpret it as friendship whether you want to interpret it as more than friends Sebastian was the former and it's also mentioned that Sebastian and Julia look alike so that kind of also makes it seem like Charles is just using Julia as a substitute for Sebastian because he secluded himself from the rest of the characters. It's also kind of hard for me to talk about this book or even just the story because I feel like once I really start getting into it, I can really get into it, but I, some, I don't know where to start, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I still think I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around it, to be honest. And I'm, I'm just gonna start talking about the adaptation because the adaptation is the book. Ladies and gentlemen, I, <laughs> I have never seen, I don't think I've seen a more faithful adaptation than the 1981 miniseries adaptation of Brideshead Revisited based on the novel by Evelyn Waugh. It's, it's the same. It's exactly the same. The dialogue seems like it's taken directly from the lines in the book. Just everything's there. And what kind of just proves it in a way is that I saw how long the audiobook is and it's around 11 and a half hours. And the miniseries is 11 episodes all being roughly 50 minutes except for the first episode and the last episode which I think are an hour and a half and an hour and 20 minutes. But that roughly makes up 11 and a half hours, which means the audiobook and the miniseries are almost the same length. And that to me just like proves it. Like, like there's nothing taken out, there's nothing added. It's the book. It's the book, and it's so well done. The casting, first of all, the casting. I keep clapping, <laughs> sorry. Um, but the casting is perfect, kind of? I don't know. Maybe not perfect, but at least for Sebastian and Charles, it's perfect. Because they're clearly my favorite characters, um, and the characters that I'm like mo most that I'm like most concerned about. Jeremy Irons plays Charles, who I already really like. This just kind of like cemented it even more that I very much like him as an actor. Oh, shoot, I keep on mixing up his name. I think it's Anthony Andrews. Anthony Andrews, I think that's the guy who plays Sebastian. And he, he is Sebastian. He is Sebastian. There's actually like a 2008, I think it's from 2008, adaptation of Brideshead Revisited that I've seen the trailer of and it looks not like Brideshead Revisited. I don't know what they did, but it doesn't look like Brideshead Revisited as well as Emma Thompson plays the mom, Lady Marchman. On the poster, she takes up like half the poster and I'm like, why is one of the non-main character? I mean, like she does play a big role, but at the same time, sometimes it's more like her presence is is there and not her as a character but yeah she's like it seems like her character is going to be more prominent than she is kind of already in the book like she is a prominent character but at the same time it almost makes it seem like she's the main character and not like charles it's just very odd to me but the casting is fantastic uh the costumes were great as well oh my god very they seemed very accurate for the time, uh, which makes me want, like, some of the historical fashion 
people that I am subscribed to on YouTube. I want to be like, hey, will you look at this mini series and tell me if this is accurate? I'd love to know. I could probably do my own research into it, which makes me wish that there were like supplements or something. I watched it on Amazon Prime, by the way. Oh my gosh, I should tell you where I watched all these things. Well, obviously I own Anna Karenina. Um, but I think this, this has been available on Netflix in the U.S., like, on and off. I don't know if it's there now. The Haunting of Hill House, 1963, I watched on TCM. Um, the TCM app, Watch TCM, I think, something like that. The 90s adaptation of that, I watched on, like, it was on HBO or Showtime or something. The We Have Always Lived in the Castle was on Amazon Prime. And so was Brideshead Revisited, the miniseries. Um, and then, obviously, the show of The Haunting of Hill House is a Netflix original, so that was on Netflix um, everywhere. I'm, I'm not sure what it's like internationally. I live in the United States, so I'm not sure about, about everything except for the Netflix show of The Haunting of Hill House. Amazon Prime is where I watched the 1981 adaptation, a uh, miniseries of Brides Had Revisited, so if you would like to watch it, I highly recommend it. I'm curious what someone would think if they were to watch the series first and then read the book, just because they are so similar. I, don't, I guess I don't really have that much to say actually about the, the miniseries other than it's just like so well done. And it just makes me wish that other adaptations could be given this amount of time to thoroughly be developed like this and to have have the book be adapted properly um, and faithfully. Of course, that's my own like opinion because I like adaptations where it's, it is the book uh, for the most part, which I already mentioned before. I don't know, some people may find this adaptation actually kind of boring, um, especially because like I said, like I mentioned, there is a lot of dialogue and you're kind of just watching characters have conversations. There's not really anything that's like momentum or momentous in terms of like really driving anything forward. And maybe at times there are like kind of briefly or like maybe within one episode, but I was really just binging it so it all blends together. As well as it's just one complete story anyway and I read the book first, so yeah, everything is just blending. I don't really know what else to say in terms of Brideshead Revisited. I feel like this sort of just prompted a lot more things that I want to look into. I did like the writing, so I would like to read more from Evelyn Waugh, and I started to do some more research into Evelyn Waugh's life and other ways that people view Brideshead Revisited as a story because especially because I know that this idea of like thinking Sebastian and Charles were a couple came from the way it's talked about in pop culture even though it's not <laughs> not that many people are talking about Brides Had Revisited but when I have heard this book referenced or the story referenced I've always got the implication it always seemed like Sebastian and Charles were a couple and that this was at least partially a gay novel. So I just like to read more articles about Brideshead Revisited and I do want to watch the 2008 adaptation even though it doesn't look like much of an adaptation. Uh, it still looks like it'll be like a good film and uh, it looks like it'll be really beautiful but I think I'm gonna have to separate it a lot from the original text and yeah I just kind of I want to do like more research into this but I also I think one of the one of the reasons why I st I did read a few articles but I ended up kind of stopping because mostly I'm just more interested in Shirley Jackson right now to be honest I don't know kind of both it's even <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying let me just grab all these books here there is specifically a biography about her that I'm really interested in picking up but it's kind of expensive so I'm waiting on that a little bit. I just I kind of want to consume all the Shirley Jackson stuff and do a bunch of research on her and you know find out more about her. These are the books I have and I'm going to pick up The Bird's Nest and The Lottery and other stories within the upcoming weeks so that'll be nice. Again like I said I'm gonna try to focus on reading because I've been really in the mood to read but I've been working on a project for school that I finished, so now I can actually take the time to read. And I feel kind of bad because I'm neglecting movies and as well as very much neglecting the Criterion channel, but I'm more into these things right now, so that's how I'm going to spend my time. 
classics mostly, reading classics and doing research pertaining to those classics. So that's it. <laughs> this is extremely long. I'm probably going to have to uh, split this into two parts perhaps because I don't know who's going to sit through like an hour and a half of me just talking about books and adaptations, but here we are. <laughs> Which reminds me that I very much would like to have a more like formal series on my channel about adaptations. Obviously something a little bit more visual, <laughs> but I don't know how I want the framing of that to be and I would I would want the structure of those videos to be pretty much the same but I, I guess I, I have to just start it and see how it how it goes and then you know it can evolve in, in certain ways and you know obviously improve but if you have any like ideas for that I would um love to hear them whether it be like a specific title uh, a specific book and adaptation or something that I should make sure to talk about in an adaptation series. I'd also love to hear what you think about any of the things that I've talked about, even if you haven't read these books yourself or seen these adaptations. Hopefully I didn't say anything too incredibly spoilery. I feel like I didn't go into that much specific detail. Whether you've seen or read any of these things, I'd, I'd love to know what you think. Thank you so much for watching or listening, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!